I wrote a scathing editorial uh, to the newspaper kind of laying out what I thought would happen. You'll bring in a new leader, you know, A, B, and C will happen and everything will uh, crumble. My thinking was, no, hell no, we, we, we can't go there. This, this just cannot happen, period. Our former president, Bobby Darling, came in and said, look, I'm not going to sign on for this SIG grant unless you all are behind it. But the bottom line is, do you want to take the bull by the horns and do it with $6 million and be at the forefront of it, or do you want to let this change happen to you? So today I'll be talking about document one, document two, but historical documents, right? The district identified an uh, up-and-coming um, administrator at a school, Brett Elliott, to be the principal. I went to high school with him, knew him, knew he was a decent person, knew he was a good leader. That was key in getting me to at least think about um, the SIG grant <laughs> of maybe being a possibility. I was hired uh, to be the principal at Peoria High in the spring of 2011 and started that fall. I personally had a lot of challenges in that. I was going to be new to the high school, uh, first year principal, as well as trying to transform a, a high school that was failing. I still remember a lot of lights being off. You know, heads would be down or they'd show a video and the movie would pop in and that's what they do for a couple days. I remember looking for students that were carrying books. You didn't see much of that. Um, you saw an awful lot of foolishness. You saw an awful lot of students messing with each other. Peoria High did have a reputation to be a little bit of a rough school and having uh, some definitely some discipline issues. You had students who wouldn't talk to you. you go up try and talk to them and you know they'd either just roll their eyes or walk away from you. The teachers were basically trying to stay alive individually, trying to figure out how to do some teaching with some integrity. This was the pride of the city and to watch it dissolve itself into uh, not something that they were very proud of and they were very very worried about it. And instead of looking at ourselves in the mirror at first as a staff, uh, it was easier to blame the students. And that was the culture in, in the building. We kind of fed that in that we kind of dummied down our curriculum, we dummied down our expectations. And slowly, I think, almost imperceptibly, the learner transitions to a point where they're not interested in doing this work. And as a matter of fact, to do this work means for them to somehow sell out to give up their identity as young teenagers. I think Peoria was very typical, but a tough example of, of, of somebody having slowly given up uh, the engagement of students. Morning. Morning, guys. Have a good day, Shannon. Morning, sir. Morning, girls. Morning, friend. Have a good day. All right, bud. Have a good day, partner. All right. Good morning, Lions! Welcome back to the pride of the city, and happy Wednesday to you. Thank you for joining us today, students. It is a chilly day, so let's make sure we're bundling it up in the morning. But just remember, even though it gets colder and maybe a little darker, school still starts at 7.30, so hustle to school each and every day to be on time. With the SIG grant, uh, one of the criteria is you have to choose a lead partner. We did not want a company who said, okay, here's all the things you're going to do because that is not sustainable because once they're gone and the dollars are gone, what do you have left? These SIG grants are given across the country to uh, external consultants and schools that are struggling. Almost everybody in the country comes in through the administration, um, spends millions of dollars on professional development with the faculty. It is usually administratively driven and, uh, and externally driven. And I think the uniqueness uh, that we really at least try to implement is that we really believe that it has to be this profession of teaching and this profession of teachers and its organized labor group um, needs to take the lead. The CEC philosophy fit hand in hand with ours that they don't believe in top down model and neither do we and in the end uh, the staff chose that that was the best fit for us. Brett was going to be in charge of getting this grant written choosing the teachers for it etc and I wasn't planning to take part in it because I had been so vehemently opposed to it you know and I figured I better just stay back a while and lay low uh, but he plopped me <laughs> and several others right on that grant writing committee 
And, you know, for those of us who were maybe in between or on the line, it very quickly shifted our thinking from is this a good idea or isn't it to wow, suddenly I'm in charge of transforming a school. Once he saw that it was not going to be dictated by the district and we were truly controlling our own destiny as far as what the grant would entail and that we were making decisions on how we wanted this to look, he started to see that um, we were controlling this. And that was a whole different ball game. And that's when teachers started to really see that this wasn't just going to be, we're gonna throw money at a problem, we're actually gonna do some hard work. When you have the staff on a daily basis working with, with CEC and others to put a plan together. They had to build an extra time for t both adults to have some of this reflection collaboration time as well as students to have extended learning time. So early on the union had to work with the district as well as the school to figure out how that time would occur. Peoria High School with the cigarette would be doing things and asking things of their teachers that all other schools in the district wouldn't. So to protect them and to protect the teachers as well as also to protect the district, you develop an MOU or a memorandum of understanding. The way I looked at it is, you know, your contract is gospel. You don't change it. You don't write these MOUs and all this stuff over here because that's a slippery slope. And once you give up some rights at this school, it's a slippery slope to giving them up at other schools. It was, as far as I was concerned, off the table. The union certainly could have said, no, 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 we're not going to do this. But the union recognized there are some things that need to happen to help make Peoria High School a better school. And some really good union leaders in that building would talk, have hard, tough conversations with their own colleagues about bringing them along. And the staff came along with them in part because I think the union uh, endorsed it, encouraged it, and um, helped problem solve when they got stuck on anything that didn't make sense. Got it to the point where we thought it was ready, CEC thought it was ready, the district thought it was ready. When we took our team down to Springfield for the State Board of Education to interview us, um, you know, I had my Muhammad Ali poster up in my classroom, but that's kind of the approach we took. We're gonna go in here and it's gonna be a one-two punch and we're gonna get this grant. It was kind of the first time that we all got to own it in front of someone else. I was very honest with them and told them why I was really opposed to these grants, but why I knew this one would work. We really knocked it out of the park. We really did. I'll never forget the ride home because Brett and I, you know, were loosening our ties. It was like we had, you know, just been in a prize fight and had knocked out the opponent. I mean, we pretty much knew we have this grant. You know, it's ours. Peoria High School is getting some major help from a federal grant. District 150 officials tell us the school has received a $6 million federal school improvement grant. <laughs> CEC was our lead partner and our main contact from the get-go was Mary McDonald. She wore several hats when it came to me. She acted uh, as a mentor, as a coach but also she put the hammer down when she needed to. And as a first year principal, I had a lot of growing to do. I struggled when I first took over because I was more worried about the culture of the building behavior wise. I would count the hours. Did we get through another class period without a major event? I thought I could somehow prevent behavior from happening if I was just in the hallways and not in these meetings. So that is something that um, Mary McDonald, CC made very clear that you know, you're an instructional leader and you must be in these meetings and you must participate and lead them. We start with high expectations and activities that are engaging and we continue to raise it. They do become aware that they're going to have to relook at their own practice. Now this is a big experienced faculty uh, of an urban high school to say you're going to have to probably rethink entirely the way you engage children in learning and because this We've got a lot of data that the old ways are not working. I remember a lot of intensity, uh, anxiety, stress. <laughs> what we were used to, I think, mostly is the old school professional development approach where the principal decides we need this PD. They bring someone in to give the PD and all the teachers sit there and listen to the PD and then go back to their classrooms and do whatever they were going to do anyway. <laughs> One of the most important pieces I think CEC as a third party helping Peoria was figuring out a way to use their professional learning time that included the use of data and that would help them understand what they needed to correct as teachers in classrooms. 
do I need to spend more time on this unit, this concept, they didn't master this, I need to go back and reteach this a different way. It took us a while from that first year to get to where you'd say it was teacher-led. In other words, we're coming in with the data, we're coming in asking the questions. A lot of times in education, teachers become almost service personnel. They're told what to do or what program to implement. Now you go press the buttons and implement it. It was refreshing, I think, for a lot of us to suddenly be looked at as professionals, as experts that the administrators are coming to asking advice. On a weekly basis, myself and a group of about five other teachers sit down and, and meet with Brett. He might have a little agenda of what he wants to talk about, but we also have some ideas for him too about uh, some things maybe we th you know, think should be done differently or better. Mary's job was to basically head the team. We had some people permanently in place and embedded in the faculty, and then we had resources coming in uh, as they wanted to see how to exercise differentiated instruction, uh, how to look at various uh, techniques and changes in advisor uh, approaches and so forth. And then my job was to come in as regularly as an outside kind of uh, observer, uh, help them do a quick little audit or snapshot and, and that gave us then a feeling of how hard to push and so forth. So I was in some senses used as a, as a photographer who would look at the organizational shifts. A lot of paradigm shifting went on in our minds. You know, we kind of knew that things needed to change in order for us to engage more students and to raise the rigor and when you're in the middle being stressed out and trying to get this ball rolling and trying to get things to work, they can come in and say, uh, number one, look, you've come a long way. Number two, look what the research says about how long this is going to take, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it really helped as far as that goes, I think, as a support mechanism. I, when I do philosophical chairs, find the student swaying me. PLC is a professional learning community. We've been able to share ideas, talk about our struggles, our strengths and really grow as a department because of it. It's basically providing enough time and resources every week for the departments, the English department, the history department, um, the math department, to come together as groups and to really look at what's the best practice in the country around engaging these students in this kind of way at high standards. In the first year, the uh, PLCs were formulaic you know, we weren't quite sure how to dig into data. Year one, year two, there was a lot of days with our PLCs that we just thought that was a waste of time. I think what changed is we started learning differentiated instruction and how to look at data and then apply that differentiated instruction to it. And then that opened us up to having conversations with each other. You know, this seems to be working well in your classroom, but not in mine. What exactly is it that you're doing? As a basketball coach, you watch video of practice of games and you try to teach your players to watch to see what mistakes they made, what things they did well, and then what things we want to continue to do and what things we'd like to get away from. One of the things that we implemented right away was a concept of actually having teachers videotape themselves. That was a huge risk we took. Um, that was where the union did back us. That was something that the union could have easily said, no way, we're not doing this. In the beginning, uh, the idea of like, oh crap, they're gonna you know, videotape me in the room and I have to share it. I couldn't really conceive of myself ever being comfortable with my classes being videotaped and then teachers <laughs> sitting around and watching me teach. It took a lot of coaching and a lot of trust on their part really to finally understand that we're not using that as a gotcha, we're using that to help them get better. It's one thing if you tell me, here's what you're not doing, or here's what we need to work on. And that can definitely, you know, make sense to me. But if I see it, it really has an impact. The feedback I've received is, I don't give kids enough time to answer a question. Uh, that's what the video's good at, is you just don't pick up on things that, that you do probably on a daily basis. My first year I had a class that was really rough, um, and so I chose to videotape that class and bring it into the PLC. And so I got a lot of suggestions from them and a lot of people actually were willing to come into my classroom and help me. And I mean, it wasn't the prettiest, but we found something that worked. And without being able to ask my coworkers for that help, I don't know where I would have been. Long story short, I think we looked up one, one day, two months later, and everybody was videotaping everybody. 
when we started out, everybody wanted to say something, you know, nice because they knew the person. The more we learned how to ask questions that got at the heart of the art of teaching, um, the less stressful it became from the person, you know, who was showing the video and the more we really dug into it. We really try to just make each other better. So I'm not worried about people saying, oh, she's a horrible teacher because that didn't go over so well. It really is. What can we do to make this better next time around? A really important piece to that um, is we were trained how to ask questions without being judgmental. You don't worry about being critiqued because you know it's in your best interest. They're not doing it to put you down, they're doing it to help you develop better skills. When we first started this, uh, our interventionist Sharon Dodds, she was actually came on as a teacher in the first year of the grant. And we were in a, a PLC and one of the teachers said, well, you know, we shouldn't plan out too much time for this speech project because most of the students aren't going to do it. He said, wait, what do you mean they're not going to do it? Every student is going to do this. There's no not doing it. And it was a total shift in mentality because all of a sudden we went from either they're going to do it or they're not and we're going to cover the material to everybody's going to do this and you better find a way to ensure they do. Yeah, this is spelled different. That's right. In the past, we never had time to get with other English teachers and say, what's working for you? What's not working for you? You know, what can we do to make this better? And now, just having that every day, that opportunity to sit down with them for one class period, it's amazing. I think before we had PLCs, I would be teaching English in this room, and Miss Graham would be teaching the same level in her room right next door, and I wouldn't know what she's doing and she wouldn't know what I was doing. There was that little communication and really no time for it. But with the PLCs built into our day, we're compelled to do that. And not only are you reflecting on it yourself, but you're getting teachers asking questions that kind of compel you to go to a deeper level of reflection. X is 8.13, let's take 8.13 times the tangent of 34 degrees. I'm a big believer in uh, discussion of best practices. Just an opportunity for us as teachers to talk about what's working, what didn't work, and that's what PLC really does give us an opportunity to do. Couldn't you say that the two expressions must be equal to each other? My teaching before and now is night and day, I would say. I went from, I could entertain pretty well. Um, I could get kids to be quiet and get them to take notes pretty well, but were they engaged and reaching a higher level of rigor? Um, absolutely not. Um, that flip-flopped because I design lessons now so that the kids are more interested in the material and the rigor is higher. We're gonna work the whole class period. I'm gonna teach bell to bell. I'm gonna to try to get you engaged right away when you come in and, and not let go. So instead of standing in front, entertaining and presenting and making sure they're taking notes and behaving and kicking kids out if they don't, I'm now you know, running around the room, uh, literally from the beginning of class to the end, helping them, whether it be in groups or individually, you know, reach that higher plane. All right, we're gonna look at one historical text and then we're gonna look at another one and then we're gonna kind of compare and contrast the two. When I started taking more risks and loosened up um, and people started coming in my room more, uh, it went from the administrator just kind of comes in like the Grim Reaper and leaves to Brett comes in and does an observation. I will tape up, you know, what it is that I need to work on so they understand that that is part of the process. I'm trying to get better as we do this. He took it to his students and said, look at this with me. Uh, you are the experts around kind of how this is not working and is working. Let's talk about it. When I look back to the beginning and where we are now, it's absolutely unbelievable how far we've come. Without the support of the city being behind our schools, there's not a, much of a chance that we could be successful. We took a chance and put out some data um, that was not um, very positive about how we have many students that are 17, 18, 19 years old but still classified as freshmen sitting in classes with freshmen. This data that we're talking about around these students that are really um, disrupting the entire school community in many, many ways, it's not something a lot of principals would like to sort of let, I don't know, the city government 
not only that, but also their own superintendent and, and district administration know. There is no secret in Peoria that they had had a history of white flight. Uh, they had one high school that perhaps was still considered um, a, a, a decent academic setting, but the other high schools had slipped. And so th the city fathers, the mayor, the city council, the community leadership, the business leadership, very, very concerned. The Partnership Council was a group that we put together my first year through the SIG grant. And it was a group of community leaders, which included uh, city councilmen, the mayor's office, uh, superintendent, uh, school board members, myself, as well as some other community leaders. And if people really understood the gains that have been made in the last few years here, they would they would be shocked. I think as a as a community, we really realized how important it was that uh, we said, look, we're not we're definitely not going in the right direction. This isn't something that just happened. It's been literally going for decades. If we kick kids out of school, that's pretty easy, but they go on the street, so now they become a city problem, a police problem many times. If you have a struggling or failing school, you're going to have a struggling or failing community because you're not producing productive citizens. And so after a year and a half of really laying out a plan, we were fortunate enough to start Peoria North, which is basically a school within a school concept for students who've been here for at least a year, but are classified as a freshman based on credits. The goal was to give them a smaller environment, smaller class sizes, and a different location where they could focus on their studies. A lot of the distractions that are here in, in the main campus, they don't have at Peoria North. We put them in a position where they can recover those credits, they get a little bit more one-on-one -on -one support, but they're not in the mainstream of the 1,300 students. And we're seeing success with that already, with students coming back to main campus, either at the semester or at the year and they're back at grade level. And interestingly enough, it's the simple uh, concept of taking those 60 or 70 students out that second, third year, basically allowed us to settle this 1500. All of a sudden, this thing kind of goes down another level in terms of calmness and focus. There was a tone set in the building that you're here to learn. And, and the students would look around and like, where are these kids that used to disrupt? Well, they're not sitting in those classes anymore. Instead of having deans like we all had probably in high school, we have basically five administrators. We don't care. So one of the things that we've put together over the last several years is we have uh, a lot of community leaders come through for tours. I think when people came in and they saw the principal of the school and the union president both talking very excitedly about academic progress, um, about our initiatives, about videotaping in our classroom, um, that that really piqued people's interest. So what happens as a result then, the city uh, representatives start to share the story with realtors, okay, and others and saying, wait a minute, we've got to help share the story because it's, it's a success for all of us. When they come for these visits, we want to make sure that they're in the hallways during passing time, and then we also share our data and our successes we've had, but we're always honest and share our challenges as well. It's a work in progress. We are continuously re-examining our data, looking at ways to uh, make sure that we're providing a quality education, so it's never done. The Teachers Union in Peoria District 150 has a new leader tonight. Jeff Atkins Dutro is the new president. He teaches English at Peoria High School. When I ran for union president, um, largely what was on my mind was the transformation I had seen at Peoria High School with teachers being treated professionally, teachers becoming teacher leaders, and the administration uh, engaging the union and vice versa and the two working together. I talked over the decision to run with CEC, actually, uh, Patrick Dolan and Mary McDonald. Throughout the whole process, I had worked with them and I made it clear to them that one of my major goals was to make sure that, you know, the positive things that happened here uh, kept going. I didn't want anything from central administration or anything else coming in and, you know, destroying what we'd done here because it was built on a very strong union uh, administration collaboration. My thinking was I would be able to keep that going. The other part of it is if you're in position as union president, you might be able to start sharing those things, you know, at other buildings um, in the district. It would be fantastic if we had shared leadership in all 27 of our schools. 
think that shared leadership model has really created an environment where maybe everybody just cares a little bit more. Make sure we're taking care of our academics, don't start falling off. Uh, make attendance a priority. You feel like it's yours, you feel like it's something you want to pour into, and uh, whether it succeeds or fails, um, now strikes you deeper. In my prior experience, if the administrator came in and things were under control and the kids weren't going crazy and you presented a lesson, uh, you were an excellent teacher. You could be either unsatisfactory, satisfactory, or excellent, and most teachers, I think, fell into the excellent category. Um, I started getting excellence after my first year teaching, and I don't think it was necessarily anything that I was doing that was fantastic, but that was kind of the norm. There was a culture in this district of a satisfactory was taboo. You don't give a satisfactory to a 10-year teacher. That meant they were horrible. Illinois, along with a lot of other states, had adopted a new teacher evaluation law. We piloted the student growth part of the evaluation. Being the pilot, we have no model to go off of. So um, we created a matrix. And meanwhile, the district union leaders were creating another matrix that would have provided over 90% of the teachers in excellent. Student growth would have put the evaluations out of kilter, if you will. Uh, so the dilemma is, wow, we've rolled it out this way. We see it's gonna be too easy. Can we change it midstream? We didn't wanna ruin the climate of coaching with that evaluation tool. By all of a sudden, everyone has excellence. And once you start that, then we're back to the, the tool that we had before. My role as kind of union president, not just focusing on Peoria High, was kind of to say, look, dude, you rolled this out. <laughs> you got to stick with it all the way through. It's not fair to change it midstream. What Brett did that I thought was rather genius is he took this to the universal leadership team, laid out what was going to happen and how we could make it more rigorous or leave it the same. We put it on the table and agreed, no matter what the vote is, we'll either use the Peoria High Matrix, which was tougher, or we can go with the easier version, which will get probably 90% of the teachers evaluated and excellent. And I left the room, all administrators left the room. We let the teachers vote, the union vote, and they voted for the tougher matrix because they knew that that was best for Peoria High School. It, it kind of, I guess, makes you proud as an educator when uh, teachers sit down and decide, yeah, we want to go the tougher route because it's the better thing to do. It's going to get us to step up more. So if we have a lot of needs improvements and no excellent rated teachers, that's okay. We have a $2 million grant because we're a failing school. So right now we're a building of a lot of needs improvement and maybe some unsatisfactory teachers according to how we're producing our students. Thank goodness we had the trust base. Uh, but I think at the end of the, of the story, uh, I think they respected our ability to keep pushing through the pain. We always say that our students, urban students, you have to earn their trust before they're going to give it. Once you understand that, and once you accept that, whether you like it or not, then you'll start having success. In year one, we spent a lot of uh, time and energy focused on relationships, building relationships. I believe that when you have a kid in a class that you teach, that kid becomes your responsibility. We try to start off every single period, no matter how the period before was, yeah. with that it's clean slate, we're happy you're here, let's get to work. If you have professional learning communities for staff, that's their place to sort of transform themselves. We knew they had to have some space for students to help develop relationships with the staff and help the students really understand this is their learning, their work. And uh, in essence, that became what we call Pride Time. It's just another class, but it's a shorter class. It's 22 minutes as opposed to 46. Pride Time provides an awesome opportunity to have real world discussions with the kids. Flip, the, flip your chair around and sit down and, and talk about what's going on in the streets, what's going on in their homes with them. The national news, we go over the kids' referrals so then we can discuss with them, well, what's the problem? Why are you getting kicked out of class? Why are you cutting class? Okay, so we're gonna do an activity today called Good Line, Bad Line. 
okay? We spent a lot of time sitting down at my computer and I just literally like, listen, I mean, what's going on in this class? You have a D or you have an F in this class and let's talk about what's going on there. And in our pride time, they will, every day they will go over our grades, make sure we're doing what we need to do to get that grade up or maintain that grade. So our pride time really helps with that. They know what their grades are. They know what their absences are, their number of tardies they have. They know, we can tell them what their homework average is in the class, what their quiz and test average is in the class. A student can never say, I didn't know. The Pride Team is an idea that we originally wrote into the SIG grant. It's basically developing a student leadership group that could kind of be an extension of my voice and of the teacher's voice. I credit CEC for really pushing the idea because one thing Mary McDonald did as well as Dr. Dolan is they listened. Even though I was very inexperienced, I did have at least have a vision of what I wanted to do and that was centered around relationships. So they encouraged me to you know, make sure you create a pride team out of your advisory. So we picked basically 25 juniors and 25 senior leaders that were voted on by the teachers. And these aren't just your top 10 students or just your athletes. It might be arts, sports, cheerleading, anywhere from B minus students up to 4.0 students. They go out in the community and volunteer and do different things. And they're also ambassadors for the school. So if people come in, we don't have to worry about having, you know, so many adults to take them around. You can have your pride team there, you know, to have an intellectual conversation with them, to show them around the school, talk about what's going on. The goal of the pride team is to consistently push them into leadership roles. So they do things in the building, but also get them out there in the community. They go out to uh, primary schools and basically have a motivational message. Huge assembly, it's, it's high energy, music, dancing, roller skating. They're motivating the students to believe in themselves, persevere, be leaders in their own building and not quit. We're trying to let every last one of them know like you are special no matter what's going on in your personal life at home or at school. We want to let you guys know we care. Raise your hands really high and say yes! 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 They can go out here and be lawyers and doctors and they, they don't have to stay in this small space. I am a leader. I am a leader. Defy the odds. Defy the odds. Set a new standard. Influencing them in a good way is really special to me, you know, that I can make an impact on some of their lives. It just holds a special place in my heart, you know. It warms my heart. It makes me feel really special and really proud of myself and my school and my group. Um, it puts a big smile on my face. I love kids. A school improvement grant is a three-year process. In typical year one of a SIG school, it's about compliance. It's are you doing what you said you're going to do. The second year is around fidelity, are we doing this well? And the third year, you're already starting to think about it as how do we do this and sustain it, the most important pieces of this work, so that when the grant goes away, you actually have the thing in place and it can sustain itself beyond the uh, three years. You're looking at four and five years. So part of our work as a third party, I think, is to help them evaluate all of the efforts in year one and two using some data, using some really tough conversations with folks in the building and in the school system where they develop really a plan for years four and five. What's the next step after we go away that's really important for you to keep? I think that's where you know the the turn conferences come in. Peoria High is our SIG school so we've been kind of the pilot trying it out. That's probably as good a place as any that Brett and others can continue sharing their work, learning from each other, and advancing it and moving it forward without maybe the additional dollars that a big SIG grant can provide. This is uh, the Great Lakes Turn uh, conference. We've been coming up here for quite a few years. Uh, essentially it's to help unions become more progressive and more involved in the academic part of uh, uh, the way education systems work. So getting away from you know simply defending the contract to becoming leaders uh, in the education field. We think we have the basics down but we also understand the level of rigor. So now we're in our fourth year, the SIG grant is gone. You walk down the halls and you're walking by teachers who are consistently talking about instruction. You're having coaches who are characterized as a typical high school coach, they're talking about Algebra 2 and assessments and what we're doing in biology. B -A -S. 
can we really put ourselves on the map and say are we preparing our students to compete with the very best across the country. And that's their journey now, is to keep moving the bar up and up and up. And we have a long ways to go, but it's night and day from what it was three years ago. Good morning, Lions. Welcome back to the pride of the city on a sunny and a beautiful, comfy, cozy, sweat paint Friday for learning. After eighth hour, you'll grab your props that you made yesterday in pride time in your eighth hour, bring those props to the pep assembly, sit by grade level and we'll rock and roll for the football final four. So those are your Friday announcements. We're gonna sweep, sweep, sweep each and every hour. So inspect your house in the class and have a great day.